Well, 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 if it isn't the final installment of our How to Play Charizard trilogy. What's good? Welcome back to the channel. Today we are kicking off a doozy where I pick up a deck, play test it, obsess over it, work on all the matchups, the ins, the outs, and the list. We refine it and work on all of the things that you need to know to get better at the Pokemon trading card game quickly. Today has tons of content as we are jamming the infamous Lost Zone engine and the new top dog Charizard EX into one deck and we are giving you Charizard Lost Zone. If you enjoyed today's content and you're not already subscribed to the channel, I have to ask, what are you doing? Go hit that subscribe button and let me know down in the comments below what you liked with today's video. Now let's dive right in. Some key points because there is a lot to cover and I will make sure to put timestamps so you can jump to which points you need to revisit. We have the best Charizard ever. It is probably one of the best ones we have ever seen or will ever see. What is the Lost Engine? There are still a few folks that have never picked up this type of engine or need a refresh because it's been a hot minute. Don't worry, I've got you covered. Two years of practice at this point. Adapting to rotation. We did have a monumental shift in the game. All of the E block left. So how do we shift our deck? I waited until after rotation because I felt like there were some cards coming that really gave this deck legs. How to succeed with the Lost Zone. As I mentioned, I've been playing the Lost Zone engine for almost two years now and really picked up all the nuances. There's several other videos on the channel. I'm gonna share you my secret. I got you covered. The power of a spec, returning mechanic that offers quite a bit of punch per card and how we can prepare those for this deck and other decks. The starting list, considerations and tech. Say you like to tinker, I'm gonna give you a couple cards to start you off in the right direction and you let me know which one's faring well for you of course everybody's favorite matchup guide i'm going to talk about the key decks i believe there's about 10 plus in there and general roadmaps that you can take to do better against each of those and last but not least the long-term outlook does charizard age like fine wine or will be gone the next f time the best charizard ever what's to say Charizard EX is statted beyond. That ability there we'll come back to, but it is fantastic typing. Dark type has been a phenomenal type for the past four or five years. It hits a lot of things for relevant weakness and very rarely gets hit on its own weakness. It has huge hit points. 330 hit points is the second largest in the game right now. And unless you're hitting for weakness, that is a monumental number to be taking down. And many decks struggle to get through one or even two of these. Three free attachments with the Infernal Rain ability that you've had a chance to look over. When you play this Pokemon from your hand to evolve, you can search your deck for three basic fire energy and attach them in any way you like. That is three free attachments just for getting your face of the deck on the board. What's not to like? And of course, scaling damage. We get to the late game, we need to know that this guy will carry us in the end. So 180 to start and 30 more for each prize card your opponent has taken. As the game progresses, this thing turns into a ridiculous beat stick, which brings me to the Charizard tag. I know, Brandon, Charizard cards are normally expensive. Why, why are you pitching this deck? I'm not gonna be able to afford it. This is the most accessible Charizard I think we have or will ever see. We have the Obsidian Flames where it came out in August. Four printings right off the bat. We have Paldean Fates in 2024. Gave us two more printings and a reprinting of the base rarity. We have a promo tin which won too many copies, neither here nor there, that gave us a beautiful shiny full art. And last but not least, a very accessible full art Charizard. So there is eight different arts of this card. You wanna go max bling, you can do that. You wanna go cheapest as can be, go for it. I've seen them as low as $3 a copy. No reason not to jump into Charizard in 2024. Now, circling back to Burning Darkness, it gets stronger as the game progresses. So I've done up a nice chart for visual purposes. It's always nice to see things in front of you. I ramble way too much. So if no prizes are taken, we're hitting some very relevant setup Pokemon. If they take at least one prize early on, because we are a little slower out of the gate, we can take out more setup Pokemon and key attackers like Rotoms and Raikou. Now this is where things start to get silly. When they take those first two prizes, now our damage is hitting those heavy hitting basic EX Pokemon that really dominate decks or those setup V Pokemon that will eventually become V stars iron hands the roaring moons the chen pows all notable threats you will see so once your opponent hits two charizard is hitting big boy numbers 270 this was once an awkward tier but when you get to the mid game and you're hitting 270 there's an Esp esparatha Espar? i don't know let me know how it's pronounced in the comments below Goldengo and Gudra, which just recently won EUIC Junior, so that one will be popping up. That is a relevant number to keep in mind. 300. This is where we start to hit take it home time because we are knocking out all of the V stars. We are taking out the Pidgeot. 300 takes out everything that you really will see in the late stages of a game. But let's say they take five because you put them on a really good map and you gave yourself more time to come back. You are taking out opposing Charizard, Fires or Dark, it doesn't matter. Right now we are taking out everything with no damage modifications. We haven't talked tool cards or any ways you can make these numbers bigger. And there are ways to do just that. But there's not just one way to play.
display Charizard. Today I'm bringing you one of the variants focused around the Lost Zone engine. And in a previous video, we talked about Charizard and Barrel. If you want to support the channel, be sure to check that out. I'll put that in the description below. It'd be great. That is my favorite way to play Charizard right now. And then the one you'll see the most of, Charizard Pidgeot. Grabbing one card every turn, fixing your combos. Charizard Pidgeot is also a very viable option, and we have a video on the channel covering that one. But what you need to know is they all rely on different ways to getting Charizard, but once Charizard's in, are carried hard by it. It is such a good Pokemon card in 2024. So now we need to circle back and talk about the Lost Zone engine. So the Lost Zone engine it is one that sends cards to the Lost Zone or a zone that is pretty much out of the game. So once it's there, it unlocks levels or stages that allow you to create powerful toolbox combinations. It is a three stage engine or when you unlock level one, you get something, level two, unlock a little more, level three. Toolbox just means variety of attackers. And today's deck is technically a toolbox, but because Charizard is so prominent, you might not see it in the name. But we will be using Comfy and Colrus to put cards in the Lost Zone. Comfy takes the top two, you keep one off the top of your deck, and the other one goes to the Lost Zone. Colrus lets you look at the top five, keep three, put two in the Lost Zone. You're handpicking which card you want for the moment. That can be a little scary, but level one, Cramorant. When there's four cards in the Lost Zone, you attack for free. 110 damage for free on a basic Pokemon, but it doesn't hit for weakness, is still freaking good. Mirage Gate. You, you can only play this when there's seven cards in the Lost Zone, but you can grab two basic energy of different types and attach them to your Pokemon in any way you like. So that allows you to get a little nutty with your combinations. You can put multiple types of energy in your deck. Lost Zone really can be how you want it. And of course, level three, this is when you unlock Sableye. This is the one that you really need to know. When you have 10 cards in the Lost Zone, Sableye can sprinkle 12 damage counters in any way you like on your opponent's Pokemon. This could be cleanup, this could be math fixing, this could just be taking something out from the bench. Sableye can be problematic depending on where the game is. Adapting to rotation. So like I said, we did lose a chunk of cards on April 5th, I do believe. These are some notable cards you see with the Lost Zone that are now no longer playable. Path of the Peak, which is good for us. Battle VIP Pass, Level Ball, Kyogre, Clara, Raihan. I'm not going to go too much in detail because they are gone and people may never step beyond standard. So they're gone. But what are we replacing it with? Well, Buddy Buddy Poffin is arguably the best card or one of the best cards out of Temporal Forces. It's an item card that lets you search your deck for two basic Pokemon with 70 hit points and put them onto your bench. Shuffle your deck. This card is live all game, so it might be comparable to VIP Pass, but VIP Pass was dead after the first turn. This is usable through the entire game, but the other notable include that comes out of Temporal Forces are the brand new A specs. We've got Maximum Belt, we've got Hero's Cape, we've got Master Ball, Neo Upper Energy, and of course, the boogeyman in the room, Crime Catcher. These are all power spike cards. Because I've listed all five, they do play well with Charizard. That's how good Charizard is. It can take advantage of any of these cards and it fills the role that you need. So when you are building your deck, this card should be in mind. What do you want it to do? Not just slap it in here because you see it. What do you want it to do? That's the power of an A spec. All right, and of course, we're gonna update some guides. So in previous, we've talked about how to play Giratina V-Star, one of my favorites, a top threat in this format. How to play Turbo Lost Box. It's still a very strong contender. It sees high degree of play and you will see a lot of it. And how to play Lost Box Kyogre. So I really jam packed everything Lost Zone and Charizard into today's video. We are gonna have to update a few of them. Kyogre cannot. Kyogre is gone. The entire face of the deck is gone, but I'm gonna give you some updated builds for you to take away with and work off of. The principles from their original video still carry true to this day. So go watch those if you want to get more on them, but I will give you some very brief updated deck lists to start with. So Giratina, right quick, this was the July skeleton. So keep in mind, and I left you two free spots. We're gonna circle the cards that are gone. So VIP, Escape Rope, Path to the Peak, they are gone. Super Rod, Water Energy, Grass Energy, Psychic. Most of these cards just need to be reworked. So if they're circled, we're gonna rework the count. And now we're gonna look at the new one. So what, almost a year later, this is the updated list. It did not change that much, but it did get the nice new Iron Leaf, the Buddy Poffin, and of course the Prime Catcher. So those are my key includes. If you wanna see how this one functions more, go circle back to that video because I'm telling you, I am still doing well with this deck 
and still trust this one with my TCG life because of how strong it was then. So that guide will carry you. If you have any other questions, let me know down below. Turbo Skeleton. So this one, again, I talked about in a previous video. What are we gonna update? Key cards that are gone right off the bat. Unfortunately, Dragonite's gone. We're gonna update some counts. They're just gonna be a little different in 2024, but the deck functions very, very similarly. Forest Seal Stone does not need to be two anymore. The new and improved Turbo Lost Box. So the matchup guides, the, the deck philosophy, how you play the deck is pretty much the same, but we are taking a, an EX focus. So we are using double vacuums to really accelerate our Lost Stone count. We're using Roaring Moon for attackers when we need it. We're using Raikou to use the Forest Stone now. Iron Hands and Hoopa really fill situations. You can just copy anything. It is still turbo. Plugged in some new attackers, giving you something to work off of. And of course, Prime Catcher is my default go-to Lost Zone uh, A spec. It's just that damn powerful. It's a switch card and a boss card. So it is very, very good. This is my updated turbo. And again, if you want to see how turbo functions, the old video and watch how to really get in the mindset of a turbo player. So. How are we gonna do well with the Lost Zone? So I've been practicing, I've been working out games, I've been really cranking out guides, and I don't think I've ever actually sat down on how to work out how to improve with the Lost Zone. Today we are. Simplify the deck building. So you'll see very complicated or very stretched thin lists. When you're starting out, just reduce single copies of cards. Up existing count. You're gonna have to make some tough choices, minimize them. If you know you have two copies of something, sending one to the Lost Zone doesn't always feel as bad. Use a notepad. This is often overlooked. If you go into a tournament of any setting with a clean notebook, you can use that to take notes, whether it be your prizes, your resources, and just energy. It goes a long way. Be prepared for some tough choices. You picked up the Lost Zone engine. You're gonna have to make a few tough choices here and there. That's okay. Don't let a difficult choice weigh on you. You'll need to work on the fly. Lost Zone is a type of deck that never sees the same situation twice. You'll see similar, but you'll never get the same thing twice. You have to be willing to improvise. And I think that's one of the fun parts of the deck that keeps drawing me back. Have fun with it. I, I feel like this shouldn't have to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. Learning tends to go better when you're finding ways to embrace and enjoy it. Maybe a mini game. Just really look for little things you're enjoying, like constructive self-reflection, win or lose identifying where things fell off, where um, maybe I might have played a card too early and that came back to haunt me. Maybe my opponent was able to pick off something I put on the board too early or I shouldn't have put that there. Do I know where things went wrong? Do I know where my opponent went wrong? As soon as you can start to identify those, don't just say, oh, well, if I had another turn, that would be it. No, don't look at it that way. Look at it. Where did things fall off the wagon? And as soon as you know, I've played a few games where I'm like, oh man, right there. I maybe sh should have rock sand instead of boss there or I should have full wrist there and thin my deck a little harder. Just little things like that you'll learn and you're just having fun with it. It's a process, it's a journey. Experience is your best teacher. Expose yourself to more decisions, play more games. Don't let a small sample size deter you because it's not gonna give you an accurate depiction of what you really expect with the deck. Will be th there be some growing pains? Certainly, but I'm telling you, as soon as you know, I can pick up certain Lost Zone decks at this point because I've played it so much that decisions are automatic. You, you just know. It, it's just like breathing. You don't get there until you practice and put yourself in uncomfortable situations. So everybody says they know exactly which card to flower selecting and when. So here's a quick fun little test. I'm not gonna answer it here, but you let me know down in the comments below what your answers were. So we have a level one choice, a level two choice, and a level three. They're not as easy as you'd think. Buddy Poffin or Comfy? Which one do you send to the Lost Zone? Which one do you keep? Polaris and Boss. Which one's going? Which one's staying? And of course, the one copy of Greninja, the one copy of Sableye. Which one do you keep and which one do you throw away? Which one will come back to haunt you and which one is the safe play? Big takeaway you should have from this, context dictates your choice. Lost Zone is like a multiple road map getting to victory. It's just determining which is the easiest course based on the knowledge you have and what's still available to you. And sometimes you have to make that tough choice, but there's still ways to win. Flower selecting will really test you and I think that's a fun little mini game within the deck. That makes it very rewarding when you get to that finish line. How to sequence better. Now I'm so ready for the community to come after me for this one. I am going to bring you some free of charge tips and tricks on how to sequence better. Conduct a free deck search. What I mean is search the deck, if possible, with a card that does not cost you any resources. Some easy examples, Artisan, Nest Ball, Heavy Ball. These cards don't require a discard cost or sending something away or really skewing one of your turns. These are fantastic cards to just get a quick peek through the deck. Right, you get to take a quick look. You see top players really skim and count cards in the stages of the game. Might take them like two or three minutes. Asui and Heavy Ball is the gold standard because it just saves all that legwork. Flip over your cards, identify your prize cards. Heavy Ball is the perfect card for that. Not every 
list needs it. But again, Heavy Ball is a great card if you're starting out, especially with a newer archetype. What's missing will influence or determine the correct order to play cards. Well, if I'm playing three copies of a card and two of it is sitting in my prize, well, I might have to change the order that I'm going to play my cards in order to get to that one copy still left in my deck. Just saying. Establish a turn objective. This one I often see people overlook and you really just have to break down the game into smaller stacks. What do you have in hand? What's in your prizes? Where do you want to end your turn? Where would you realistically like to be? Be realistic with it. You might have one clear goal. I want to declare a particular attack. Do you need more Pokemon? Do you need a particular attack? Do you need to find a card? One clear goal might be the objective most times, or you might have smaller goals. Maybe I want to thin out my deck a little more in case they try to Iono me or Roxanne me or judge me, or maybe I want to fuel my loss zone count a little bit more because I know I can push a little more. Those things you just kind of identify on a turn to turn basis. What'll help me now, maybe what'll help me in the future, and what'll get me there, the correct, you know, in quotation marks, order. Gen Pao is there just because. It's a little community joke, okay? A quick example. So setting up. This is one you'll see with players, and with Lost Zone especially, is you want to play your blind drop before you start digging for Pokemon Search. Because if you're holding on four Charmanders, yes, a Nest Ball would get the Charmander, but there's still a chance for me to draw one. And my luck is better if there's four of them in the deck than there is if I pluck one right away. So a quick example off the bat. So Colrus, Buddy Poffin, Greninja, Nest Ball, Ultra Ball. We're not factoring in flower selectings here, but this is a prime example you see. So your first option, if you have one, will be a Colrus. Why Colrus before the Poffin? Like I just said, if there's four copies of a particular Pokemon in the deck, we want to pluck a few of them out. Taking them out too early means it's going to be harder to find them. Then we buddy pop. So more information leads to better decision making. Figure that one's also a no-brainer. Poffin can finalize our setup. So say if we naturally drew into the first couple Charmanders or Comfies, the Poffin then allows us to finalize the rest of our board or thins out the extra ones to help us dig a little deeper for, say, those Giratinas or those Radiant Greninja. Ninja just can see, discard an energy, draw two cards. It's the last stop typically before we are using the dedicated dirt. Nest Ball, Ultra Ball. These are premiums because they're extremely valuable late. So we don't want to use them until we have to. But we typically want to hold the Ultra Balls and Nest Balls because they're either burnable to shuffle up the deck late or they can grab things late. So we don't really want to use them unless they're, oh God, everything's going poorly. Just grab me that Pokemon, put it on the board. All right, okay, good. I can live with that. Another one, finding a specific card. I'm gonna use boss's orders, for example, because you're looking for that game winning boss. It comes up often and I have people ask, how could I have played my cards a little better? Well, in the context of this deck, thin. We're trying to pull cards out of our deck to hypothetically increase our odds of finding said card being boss's orders. So where do I start? Did they Iono your boss's orders away? Do you have any others? If they Ionoed it away, we somehow have to reset the order of our deck. This is where those nest balls and ultra balls I was telling you to hold on to really come in handy. One, because they pull cards out of the deck and two, they force the deck to be shuffled. If you did not put the boss's orders in this case at the bottom of the deck with an Iono, do not shuffle the deck. Do not use a nest ball or an ultra ball or anything that will shuffle the deck. Now we have to really start thinning. And this is where the example comes in. So if boss is in the deck, but it is not at the bottom, we are gonna use as many flower selectings as we reasonably can because we are trying to blindly pull it out of the deck. So flower selecting, switch card, flower selecting, maybe a jet energy, get a third one, concealed cards. Last order on the operation, because this is gonna shuffle the deck, we are gonna use Poke Gear. It allows us to look seven cards deep and usually the boss's orders will be there. Sometimes it's not, and that's just nature of the game but you have done everything you could to try to thin down or get a lower size without shuffling the deck. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. If it doesn't, I highly recommend reaching out for one of the many uh, coaches out there. There's a few that I can recommend, but I'm not gonna name drop anybody, but I'm telling you, you find one that works for you and they'll go into more in-depth examples. But basically sequencing is just a scary word in the community for playing your card in a way that gets you to the objective you want. Some lost zone misconceptions and concerns, and I see these quite a bit and I'm gonna dispel them right now, let's go. The deck is slow, won't I just go to time? Not necessarily. New pilots, regardless of the deck, tend to be slower. Practice and film familiarity speeds up your game decisions get your repetitions in. For the love of Arceus, get those reps in. I see it all the time when I'm teaching newer players or somebody's asking questions about the deck or a new tech card or whatever. If you don't know what the deck is supposed to do, of course you're gonna be slow because you're reading your cards, you're thinking. There's nothing wrong with that. 
but the more you practice with it and the more situations you see, the more you're like, oh, I have the answer to that. I know what I can do. You, you spend less time making those decisions because you've done it before. I'm not smart enough. I thought the exact same thing when it came out in August, 2022 scared me off i was watching top players i'm like there's no way like i'm never going to be able to juggle my resources this is just too too hard bs pokemon has a design philosophy so players can pick up any deck starting out the difference between where players lie is as you try to master it your proficiency and skill will come with experience and practice again get your practice in some need more some need less don't count yourself out too early i know some people who can look at a deck of cards first time pick it up play it and know exactly what they're doing just based on the synergies and the way their brain works and they pick it up might be previous experience whatever and then i see some people might need 100 games to really master a deck and then as soon as they're behind it they're automatic they're one of the best players in the room it doesn't matter if it takes you 10 games or 100 games if you want to be there you can be there i firmly believe that you can get yourself as good as you want to whether it's with coaching without absorbing information like a sponge do not count yourself out you can do this i'm not having fun with it it's not for me and this goes to any card game this goes to anything you're doing play what you like it's okay not to like something or to like a deck don't let someone dictate how you're choosing to enjoy pokemon or your hobby this is something you are using with your free time to do something that you will hopefully enjoy if it's not vibing with you and that's okay there's plenty of other decks to pick from. Right now, Pokemon is in a wide open state where as long as you understand your cards and how to play it, you can usually do pretty well. So there's no reason why you should be playing a deck that you hate. Now, we're up to the power of Ace Specs. So I'm trying not to keep you too long. We're gonna power through and maybe pick up the pace here. Ace Specs, there's one per deck. These are power cards. They're not necessarily consistency cards, but they do offer momentum changing plays. Quick pause and look at the Prime Catcher on screen. Switch your opponent's benched with their active. That's a boss's orders effect. If you do, switch your active with your bench. So they just slammed a boss and a switch in the same card and made it an item card. That's a power card. That is a game changing card. Key KO, line it up. Very hard to find a card like this. This is a good card. Some cards in Charizard, maximum belt. Your Pokemon does 50 more damage before weakness to EXs. That's a power card. Hero's Cape, the Pokemon this card is attached to gets 100 hit points more. That's a power card. It's a defensive power card, but it is a power card. Neo Upper Energy, the stage two Pokemon this card is attached to, gets two of any combination of energy, but it can only be attached to a stage two. That's a power card that fulfills an attack cost rather quickly. That also plays with Charizard. And of course, Master Ball. Search your deck for any Pokemon, reveal it and put it into your hand. Okay, maybe that one's consistency, but pulling a Charizard out of nowhere feels like a power move. So flex on them, flip that Master Ball there, Giovanni, and get that Charizard. Might be the game clinching Charizard. A one for one trade is not bad. It's like playing a fourth copy. So these are generally the A specs that you will see. The problem with A specs. Now I was touting it up. A specs are great for the game, but at the same time, they're irreplaceable. It is very difficult to fill that role because it'll take multiple cards if it's even possible. The unfair stamp coming in May in the Twilight Masquerade set is a prime example of that. You can only play this card if your opponent was knocked out. One of your Pokemon was knocked out the previous turn. Each player shuffles their hand into their deck the player playing this card draws five, your opponent draws two. I don't think there's a card in the game that really fills that kind of role because it can be played early, it can be played late. Like you're not replacing that type of card. That's why I use this one. They tend to be expensive upon release. Prime Catcher right now, pre-release, was going for the cost of the other 59 cards in many of the Charizard decks. Some will always be better than others. If you play Neo Upper and someone's saying, why aren't you playing Prime? Well, you have to really justify it with the role you're looking for, but many times the card will fill a better role if you just tinker a few other cards. So some will always be better than others. The prime example was looking back at Computer Search the first time around. Very few A specs, if any, could ever compete with that card. It was just that powerful. Many people go, why aren't you playing this? And they made a pretty good case. They're limited recovery once per game. They've intentionally made it difficult to recover these cards. You may miss your opportunity to use the A spec and that puts you at a disadvantage. It's not like a Radiant Pokemon where you can recycle them and get them back rather easily. No, if you miss your Unfair Stamp or if you miss your Prime Catcher, that sucks to suck because many times you're not getting it back. Anyway, on a more positive note, we're going to take a look at the 60. So I've ironed this one out. And this one here, if you really stop and look at it, see why I waited for rotation to hit. Buddy Poffin grabs Comfies and Charmanders. VIP pass, yes, it was the same, but it only worked on the first turn. If we miss a beat, we can still catch up. 
this deck likes to go first, whereas most Lost Zone decks usually like to go second. We have the Switch cards, we have the Rare Candies. I am keeping my count simple so you can pick it up and really run with it. That's I'm making decisions easier. Manaphy, because we have a lot of small Pokemon. Delphox, we're gonna touch upon that. Your four Colrus, your two boss, your Roxanne, your counter catcher, eight fire energy, three jets, two psychics. I've really made decision making in this deck pretty easy. So you're not going, oh my God, what do I throw away? I really don't want to throw that away. These are all interchangeable cards, depending on what you're expecting to see. Currently, I'm respecting the heck out of Turbo Hands because Amp you very much. Taking two prizes off of a very small Pokemon can be problematic. So we need a way to quickly respond. Two vacuums allows us to kind of slam in a disruption or just clear all their energy off the board. Boss and Roxanne, these cards are also interchangeable. Go second boss if you like the aggression. Again, I'm respecting hands, so I want to be aggressive. Second Roxanne, if the game shifts and you want to be a little slower, a little more defensive. Counter Catcher could also be a card you cut for a second Roxanne. Can't go wrong with a second Roxanne in the late. Key cards. These ones here, we've got Colrus, because again, we're digging through the deck, fueling our loss zone, getting to our item cards. Nest Ball, because it grabs any basic Pokemon, and in the early stages, we just need to get into the game. Buddy Poffin, same thing. Comb fees, mana fees, Charmanders. There's a lot of basics that we can grab with the 70 hit point Buddy Buddy Poffin. Great, great card. And you can play it at any time. So we can reestablish it anytime. It's not a dead card late. Charizard and Rare Candy. We play three and three of each. So being able to accelerate energy, because Charizard is our main means of accelerating energy. These two kind of go hand in hand for that. So you really have to keep an eye on those. Prime Catcher, super odd. Prime Catcher is our power play. This is our comeback. This is our switch. This is the game changing card nine times out of 10. Super odd is our recovery because we're using Infernal Rain, maybe to retreat, maybe to accelerate. We want to keep tabs on our recovery. So our power play and our recovery are strong elements of this deck. And lastly, Charmander and Cramorant. Charmander gets our Charizards, which gets all of our acceleration and our big beat stick. Hands down, the second most or the most important attacker in the deck. Getting to spit innocently either softens things up or it finishes things off or allows us to really trade with one prize deck. So Cramorant is very, very strong in this deck, whereas in other decks, it's just kind of there because it's part of the Lost Zone engine. Do not Lost Zone these. If you can help it, these are generally important cards. If you prize check first, then you can make the informed decision on what you're gonna put Lost Zone. First priority, these are almost never. So try never to send these off to the Lost Zone if you can help it. Prime Catcher, it's a one of, what, what's more to say? Boss's Orders, you only get two if you play the one Again, you're reducing your ability to gust up things and hit with your big Charizard. Cramorant, we're only playing one. And Culverus is the only way we're digging through the deck. So we really want to hold those for as long as possible and use them rather than send them off. Tough choice. Typically, you're okay sending one of these off depending on where your prizes are. So one copy of Charizard. I find two is more than enough to the run of a game. One finds its way in the prizes, one finds its way in the loss zone, so three is like the sweet spot. Psychic energy, we play one more than we need, so you can always toss one to make an easier choice. Fire energy, you can usually get away with tossing one, maybe two, because you want anywhere from four to six of them still left in the deck. Super rod, again, you can play games with just one rod, but my word, does it get tough. So you try not to toss these unless you absolutely have to. Depends on the matchup. Do they help versus a certain deck? Manaphy, Sableye, Vacuum. If there's nothing that really helps with our Lost Vacuum, we just toss that. Oh, no, Turbo Hand, send it off. Manaphy, no Radiant Greninja, no means of uh, applying pressure to our bench. See you later. Sableye, they played that Jirachi early because they're seeing Colrus, they're seeing Comfy. Well, not necessarily, but again, sometimes Sableye is harder to work with. Or maybe we want to stay on that 2-2-2 prize race and Charizard is easier to do that than Sableye. So then he gets sent off that way. Identifying where your win condition or your easier win conditions come from is what really gives Sableye its strength. When to spit and when not to spit. So attacking for free seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, I'm going to do it as often as I can. Well, not necessarily. So I'm going to give you a couple goods and a couple bads. Going for the turn one win. We keep it in here for that kind of reason. Sometimes your opponent only gets one Bidoof or one Frigibax, or something small on the board, and pass. So with a Colrus and a couple flower selectings, or a Vacuum and something else, we, we've just won the game. Cramorant can get you those cheesy wins, so that's always nice. Soften up something bigger, specifically a basic EX that they will be attacking with, or a V-Star or V that they are evolving up into. We want to bring those down because Charizard EX does not hit very hard early. Those are good ones. Destabilize their board. I mentioned it with the Donk, but sometimes they put maybe one or two Bidoofs or Frigibaxes or Comfies, 
Can we pick off a key Pokemon that will become a bigger threat later in the game? Go for it. If you can see an opportunity where, hey, they only have one Frigibax on the bench, take it out. If you're playing against opposing Charizard decks, they are now hitting 210 damage. That can be problematic. If you hit a support Pokemon, Rotoms, Luminion, uh, Squawk Abilities, those cards usually tend to fall off the board through Collapse Stadium, Turo Scenario, or um, any other means. They're, or Penny, I think is the other one. They're trying to get them off the board usually. If it's a deck that looks like they might pick it up, Charizards, Gardevoirs, anything playing Collapse Stadium, you Lugia is another one. Hitting a support Pokemon is kind of a wasted turn and you're just giving them a chance to knock it out. Using Cramorant too early can also activate an opponent's comeback card. Reversal Energy, uh, Counter Catcher, that upcoming unfair stamp, you name it. Losing the bird early also means we have to use a rod to get it back. When in doubt, sacrifice the comfy. When to lost mine. Now this one is getting a little more situational. And this one, if you're not certain of, I can understand. But when you want to, when the coast is clear. No Jirachi means you're fair game. Lost mine can be problematic once you have 10 cards in the lost zone. Taking out a draw Pokemon. A key one lost mine takes out, especially in say a Chen Pao matchup, is a Bavaro. If you're picking away at their consistency, you are slowly chipping away for a very detrimental Roxanne. It might not seem like it right away, but taking out a Bavaro or a Bidoof or anything like that goes a long way later into the game. Fixing math. So again, Charizard works in intervals of 30. So sometimes Sableye can get you there faster or you can clean up or they have very small evolving Pokemon that you can pick off. That's nice too. Sableye is very good for just kind of being the janitor of the deck. Don't force it. So if they play the Jirachi early and you're still benching the Sableye, looking for an opportunity, maybe you chase the Jirachi off the board or you just really pull something to the active just so you can lost mine it, you're working too hard. Don't force that one. Don't spread too wide. I see people go like two, 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 or three, 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 three. Well, switch cart will immediately wipe that damage off. You typically want to either work in at least a four or the safer one, if there's no Jirachi, is a seven and five split. Because if they're playing switch carts, they can't get it all off and you are taking a KO nine times out of 10. These are your good ones. The power of Sableye has definitely become a meta call. Jirachi and Mist Energy block Lost Mine. So it makes it a varying tool of success. Know when to use it and accept when not, it's not a viable option. However, do not Lost Zone it too early. As soon as you Lost Zone it, you are freeing up your opponent from a line of play that they once had to respect. So if you throw it away and you didn't have to throw it away, they might go, oh, I don't have to bench Jirachi, so now that's a free bench spot. By having Sableye in the deck, you're forcing them to respect it. You're forcing them to play something they might not necessarily want in a game for you to pick off with a Cramorant. In the late game, Sableye even, just the threat of Sableye can be good. Delphox versus Greninja. So I know what you're saying. Why is this even an argument? Everybody plays Greninja, your water energy, it draws cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Delphox though, hear me out. It hits harder. It hits 120 to the active and to the bench. And it puts two cards in the lasso. So it can hit off your support Pokemon looking at your barrels. It can hit off that new Iron Leaves Pokemon. It is a fire type attacker that we are sorely lacking right now because we're not incorporating the fire EX and it adds cards to the lost zone. Sometimes I found it very difficult getting to 10 in the lost zone. So by putting at least two energy into the lost zone, it could be any, it doesn't have to be fire. It could be psychics, it could be jets, whatever. Putting those two in there allows us to get to lost mine and makes them have to respect it. So not only are they dealing with the Delphox, they have to bench the Jirachi. So that means the Jirachi will be there later for Cramorant to come get. Or we can always recycle Delphox and then go get it later. You know what I mean? The Delphox is very good and it pair it with a Roxanne, chef's kiss. But what about Greninja? So if you opted to play the water energy, we are currently not. You should play at least two to three copies. Concealed cards draws cards. So either way, we're playing it. We're going to be using it to draw cards. It's a one retreat Pokemon. So if Beach Cord or you play the uh, new rescue board or anything like that. It's very easy to move around and it's a one prize Pokemon. Greninja is a different option. You have to dedicate more space to it. So I'm going with Delphox in this build because it plays into the Infernal Rain and we can fetch them out of the deck when we need them. That's just me. So some text and consideration. These are some cards I consider in revisions, but not in today's list. The Doof and Barrel, a one, one line. It is very, very thin. Tord showed us with Pidgeot that you can play it in there and it's not hard to find it with the Buddy Buddy Poffin. We can throw a copy of Ultra Ball and Industrious Incisors protects us in the late game. Maybe you're missing pieces. It's a cleanup Pokemon. It's really, really good and it's not hard to incorporate in this deck. Radiant Charizard. So I find Radiant Charizard is another one that I strongly considered. But there's a card coming in Twilight Masquerade that fills a similar role. Because I like the consistency of Radiant Greninja, I did not opt for it this at this time. But I have seen a few builds with people playing Radiant Charizard 
and just adding extra draw or adding extra Poke Gears, which then leads me to some other Pokemon, a 1-1 Pidgeot. You might want to play a fourth rare candy if you're doing that. A second copy of Cramorant. We've legitimately talked about this. It is one of your best attackers in the deck. I don't hate if you play a second copy. Charmeleon. This one, pre-rotation I was playing because Path of the Peak was an absolute menace, and sometimes you don't want to go rare candy under Path, but when you can just go candy, grab the energy, there's no Path to block you. Charmeleon was a little more free, but if you see a lot of Devo, maybe you might want to consider it. Pidgeot and Four Seal Stone. This was in early drafts too, but then fell out of favor. So you Four Seal Stone attached to the Pidgeot. It could grab you absolutely anything. Usually it's grabbing a Culverse or a Rare Candy. You can make the space for it. It's just a two card combo. But then the question becomes, how do you find the Four Seal Stone when you need it? I'm not playing Town Store. You could do that, but again, I wasn't. Again, other max uh, A specs, we have Max Belt for 50 more damage. Let's you swing a little harder earlier in the game. Master Ball just grabs that missing piece at the right time. The Suey and Heavy Ball. You're learning the deck. You want to check your prizes rather easily. Don't blame you. Hero's Cape. You want to present a 430 hit point Charizard at the end of the game when you're slapping in Roxanne's or Sableyes or anything like that. Could be more than they can deal with. And of course, Rescue Board. You might want to cut a Jet Energy, get the board in there, and then you can Lost Vacuum it off and accelerate your Lost Zone camp. I've seen some Lost Zone engines play it. I haven't experimented enough with it to really be a fan of it, but it is presentable. Problem cards. There's three Boogeyman cards of the of the format that you should be aware of when you play this deck in particular. Eerie. This card is a damn problem. Your opponent reveals their hand and discards up to two item cards they find there. So not only is this grabbing our rare candies, this grabs our super rods, this grabs our switch cards, our switches, our nest balls, our buddy poffins, really any item card that that makes the deck tick. Eerie can just pluck out early and we'll go, oh shit. We better have a Colrus to really deal with this. Arceus decks are playing it. Charizard Pidgeot decks are playing it. Control decks are playing it. I've seen it in Gardevoir. There's quite a few decks that are really playing this card. Hell, we could play it if we want it to be that type of person. Technical Machine Devolution. We're not playing any Charmeleons, and I really don't think we need to. Pairing off Hand Disruption with a Devolution could really wipe our Charizard EX off the board, which is our heavy hitter. So by devolving your opponent's Pokemon and placing the highest stage into your opponent's hand, this could put real stress on our three copies of Rare Candy. So if you burn one early or one goes to the Lost Zone or you've already used two, again, it puts finite resources under a real bad crunch. And I'm not going to overly tech for that because I don't see it enough to really worry, but it could be a problem down the line. And of course, hand disruption. So this is your Ionos, your Judges, your Roxanne's. Anytime they're shuffling your hand, especially with Iono where they're putting it at the bottom of your hand and it's out of reach, Putting a couple Colrus really hurts. Like, we have to dig. We have to reset our deck. We have to then sequence properly to get those damn Colrus back. And a couple awkward decisions with flower selecting. So they can be slightly problematic and they just cut you out of the game. But these are general flaws. I'm going to start doing this for a lot of decks. But these are weaknesses many decks will just have in theirs that catch you in the crossfire. All right, let's talk matchups. First up, Ancient Box. So this is a very interesting one, but the sheer health of Charizard goes a long way. Go second when possible. They want to initiate the prize trade. They want to take the first one off the bat. We don't always want to give them that. So if we can, go second. Clear the Flutter Mains with Delphoxes. Sometimes they'll put it on the board to deny your Comfies. Awesome. They're bait for later. They're not going anywhere. So Delphox can get you a quick two for two, whether it's to start or whether it's to end the game. Lost Vacuum, their tool cards. This brings your Charizard math back into relevant ranges. It also keeps them from trying any funny shenanigans should they be playing one or two copies of the EX. Trade in twos. We're looking for twos. Charizard can usually soak a hit and then punch back. So you go punch, soak, punch. Charizard's done his job. There's two prizes. Delphox, same thing. You might run three Charizards or you might run a Delphox and two Charizards. That's usually the best way to go. Sometimes you can strand with Sableye and Countercatcher in the active and Lost Mine and set KOs up for Delphox or maybe take out a Flutter Main and then set something else up. So they only usually play one to two copies of Switch Cart or Switch. I haven't seen any big brain innovations quite yet, aside from like what's currently running. Uh, Prime Catcher typically is their A spec of choice. Sometimes it's the drum, but if Prime Catcher is there, that's usually their only switch option. Charizard is the beat stick. You go two for two, dare them to bring out that EX, and you just plan accordingly with your Sableye. This is a very good Sableye matchup. And of course, Delphox, like those two cards carry in this matchup. It's a good one. Raging Bolt EX. So go first one possible. We just need to be evolving. We need to be putting cards in our Lost Zone and kind of accelerating. They're going to try to race us off the board. So getting to go first and do a little bit before they start running is good because Squawk and then just kind of watching them go does suck. Identify the variant. So is it a Palkia build? If it's an, a Palkia build, then you might be in for a bad time. But if not, it's a Sandy Shocks. We're in for a good time. Chase the support Pokemon. 
Squawkabillies, Mews, Luminions, uh, Sandy Shocks. Those are all small Pokemon in the 170, 160 to 220 range. Those are doable targets. We can take those down. Charizard only for KOs. There's no reason for you to present an EX unless we're sizing something up and taking it off the board because you are looking for a seven prize card game. What this means is we're gonna let them take the first or two prizes roughly. Charizard then swings for 240. Then we are gonna look for an opportunity to take something smaller off the board. Maybe it's with some Cramorant or some Sableyes and then we'll springboard another Charizard. Typically we're trying to sprinkle damage here and there. Hell, we might even just run them off the board with Charizard and go, do you have it? Do you have it? Key cards, Roxanne can break their board. You gotta keep an eye on how many Sadas they've thrown, how many Pal Pads they might've burned through. Yes, those Sandy Shocks are problematic. And I think chasing those is more important than chasing the Raging Bolts. Nine times out of 10, because they could have three of them on the back line. That's three energy off the bat then they only need three energy accelerated and other means to knock you out with the raging bolt so if you're taking the sandy shocks off you're making each subsequent ko more difficult to deal with raging bolt is a pretty favored one spoiler alert it will be the next video i cover on the channel so be sure to keep an eye out for that next up we are talking Roaring Moon EX. This is a deck I've been really enjoying. It's a ton of fun. It's very powerful. It's very freaking quick. Go second when possible. Do not let them get that first KO. Bait out the EX. So we want to try to get our EX out there swinging because we want them to frenzy gouging. We want them to go two for two with us because then we can use Delphox shenanigans. If they fall into Roxanne range, for the love of God, make them pay. Delphox, either the EX and a Fluttermane or... You soften something else up they usually don't play enough switch cards for you to worry about them you know reducing the damage from a lost mine or from a delphog because we're sizing up our board for later this one is very quick establish a second charizard at some point in the game it will carry you whether we've dealt with their ex's or they just don't have enough cards in the discard pile for vengeful feathers to be very hard, hard hitting you can usually go two for two there um, it's difficult generally for them to s establish two Roaring Moons through the run of a game if you're slamming them with hand, uh, hand Disruption. So if you're not playing Roxanne or you had to toss it early, you might be in for a bad time. But a good Roxanne makes their hand very thin. They are playing to Dunsparce and they have to dig out of it. But again, they're, they're looking for so many moving pieces. They need the Dark Patches. They need the Retreat. They need the Sada's Vitality. They need the Energy Attachment in turn. Maybe they just discard one too many too early. And then they're like, oh shit, what do I do? I haven't had many fits with this one. But again, as people get better with the deck you will have to look for some interesting maps counter catcher sableye as long as you're not putting a to <laughs> dun sparse into play um if they're still playing flutter mains bring that up just soften that up or a roaring moon with no energy on it sprinkle something on the bench you know look for a cheesy lost mine play where you can buy yourself a turn you want your charizards to try to trade two for two or bait out the ex's because as soon as you get the ex's off the board the game gets so much easier because in the late stages after they've burned through the ex's that roaring moon like the the baby one can't really punch through you without hitting it twice roxanne if you want a second copy i totally get it this is another one of those matchups where i always go man if my 61st card could be there i think it will be another roxanne next up we've got chen pao this is perhaps our worst matchup on the board by far it's just ugly they're playing hands they're able to hit you for six energy knockouts it is a tough one so let's oh, let's just get through this one go first one possible they don't do jack when they go second on that first turn Target the Bax Caliber. Right now, they are still with the same known quantities. I've seen a few venture out to Arctabax. I am playing Arctabax, but I don't think the mainstream has caught on yet or will catch on. Just try to chase those Bax Calibers off the board, make them reestablish three candies. That's all they got. Don't overbench EXs or Vs. Those are victims. They're all in victim weight. Chen Pao is going to make them look like Swiss cheese. Bonus. If you see a Delphox opening, whether they go tuba barrels, two Frigibax, a Chen Pao, and an Iron Hands, or they don't bench the Manaphy because they're just not respecting you, face it. Delphox into tuba barrels is a beautiful thing because that means your Roxanne is going to stick and they're going to have to really dig for it. Because nine times out of ten, if they have tuba barrels on board, they do not have Radiant Greninja. So when those puppies go down, or beavers, I guess, then you have a chance to climb back. But this matchup is still very, very ugly. Key cards, Manaphy, because they're gonna Moonlight Shirk and you right into the next game. Countercatcher, again, you can stall up something, whether it's super cold and then try to lost mine, or you can spit innocently into it. Prime Catcher, you might be able to sneak an early KO and just take their lone Fridgy backs off the board or lone Bidoof. That can help set them back greatly. But this is a matchup I go in going, okay, it's an uphill battle. Let's see the best I can do here. It just does not feel good most games. Next up, Turbo Hands. This is the one I'm over teched for. You know what? Bring it on. Go second when possible. They want to attack first. They want to charge up. They want to take a quick, easy knockout. We're not letting them do that. Bench wide, double up. Two Charmanders, two Comfies. You're on a roll. Pair vacuums with Hands KOs. What I mean is they're going to amp you very much. Bring Charizard up to 240. So the best way to, to, to punish this deck 
is you want a lost vacuum, the heavy baton, then knock out the hands and make them reestablish another hand. And if they dare try to do that again and take another two prizes on you, whether it's a comb fee or Greninja or whatever, we have a second vacuum in the deck and I dare you, I dare you to set up a third amp you very much before I knock out one of your iron crowns. Good freaking luck. Multiple Charizards. Again, I led into it a little bit. Two Charizards in the run of this game usually makes them concede. The first one is pretty scary for them to deal with because again, you're applying pressure faster than they can. So once Charizard's on the board, that is the hardest thing for you to do. Once Charizard is on the board, this game feels very, very free. Evo could be in this deck. I don't expect it right away, but it could evolve to that point. Iron Leaves. Three Grass Energy could make this very interesting. We are playing the vacuum, so maybe not. But again, you never know where the technology evolves to. Maybe they find a way to use Rebu Pot. I don't know. Right now, I'm not too worried about Iron Leaf. Key cards, Roxanne, Hand Disruption, Double Vacuum, Goodbye Batons, and Charizard are a lovely beat stick. This one I am over prepared for because it's the hype deck on the block. I'm not losing to the hype deck on the block. All right. Lost Zone Box. They do boxy things better than we do, so we might be in a bit of trouble, but don't worry. I'm going to give you the best tips I can for this kind of matchup. Look to identify the variant. Are they still running Radiant Charizard or are they running Radiant Greninja? Bad news, they might be going heavily Greninja because I'm seeing more popularity with it. It is doing better. It has a lot of options. I don't blame them for going that way. Watch their Lost Zone count. My rule of thumb is when they hit about three, four, Manaphy should be on the board. I don't care because they can quickly get out of hand. And with the double vacuums, they can quickly jump up to seven or eight, or they can go from four to 10 rather quickly. And you'd be surprised. They play a lot of switching cards, but things can be scary. And then they're jumping into a Moonlight Shuriken. There's two prizes. Or they're jumping into an Iron Hands out of nowhere and taking two prizes, forcing you to respond with a Charizard. And they've already got the backup plan with the Roaring Moon EX waiting for you. Frenzy gouging. So the deck can really snowball. You just have to be watching their count, watching their deck side. What you need to do is double Charmander early if you can help it. Conserve your resources, candies, Charizards, energy. Those are your friends. They're gonna go a long way in this matchup because Charizard does so much. Take out the Comfies. Why you take out the Comfies is they have so many switching cards, so many switching options. They're not only trying to hit the loss zone numbers like we are, they are trying to remove unnecessary cards from their deck to, to prevent a Roxanne or Iono from sticking. If they have a very small deck size, they don't care what sort of hand disruption comes their way because they're going to be able to dig out of it. So they will be excessively thinning. So if you can take out a Comfy early with a Cramorant and not be punished from it, please, by all means, go for it. Time your Roxanne. Again, we're picking off their Comfies and we're applying pressure as quickly as they are. Well, we're not going to be applying as quickly as they are. We're going to try to spam the Roxanne. So this one, again, you might want a second copy of it if you feel like it's more defensive in this matchup. Roxanne, Roxanne, Charizard, Beatstick, dare you to hit with the moon. Good game. Uh, this one is very dicey 50-50. So Roxanne's are strong cards. They don't usually play Jets. So that's one thing we have utility for. It could be a concealed cards or it can be a pivot. Charizard EX is such a beefy boy that they're very rarely going to hit you with the gouging twice, but they're definitely going to hit you with the ampu very much at least once. You got to figure out your map on this one. I usually just try to take the comfies off the board. I dare the hands out. And then once they get to three range, because they're so eager to take my Charizard off the board, they usually have a thicker deck size. And then the Roxanne is what I'm trying to find. I'm literally trying to sequence my turns for Roxanne mid game because you only need four cards in the Lost Zone usually. You don't even need cards in the Lost Zone for this one. You just need your Charizards on the board. And if you can use Roxanne's earlier, the better. Giratina, my beloved. We're gonna go first against this deck because we would rather have the Charizard EX than we would the Lost Zone count. So we would much rather have that. Delphox, Comfies. Until they start bringing Manaphy back, punish them for it. They'll run maybe a couple Giratinas and a couple uh, Comfies. If you can turn two, take their Comfies off, it makes their thinning much more difficult and it makes it much harder to find the Requiem and the Impact because they don't pop off. They rely on Comfies to get them there. Don't rush the three prizes. They are gonna run you off the board with Roxanne and Temple of Sinnoh. It makes your jet energies useless. Soften up Giratina. So rather than jumping to three, and I think I've said this with all other Charizard builds, we play plenty of boss or we play many other means of just switching and going after stuff. Bring both Giratinas down below the 240 range if you can help it, whether it's a spin innocently, whether it's double a Delphox bringing them down, you name it, probably not Delphox, or you just punch them with a couple Charizards. It makes your late game cleanup super easy because they're not playing Turo. They're not playing other cards. Just soften up the Giratinas. Cram, Sableye, Delphox, or Charizard punches. Roxanne, Charizard. So they will fall into the three range usually before we do because we're not eager to get there because we know what's coming. Make them burn the Requiem early. They've fallen out of favor of the belts and they're going for the Prime Catcher. So we know they've got the Iron Leaves, they've got the Requiem, and 
the Iron Leaves, and the Requiem. That's it. That's the easiest way they're getting four prizes. So forcing them to really dig through more Charizards means they're going to have to work a lot harder, and we can punish them for that. Sableye doesn't come up as often for them. Yes, they'll use it, but again, Delphox can clean up. So if we take two prizes, we soften up the Giratinas, and then in the end, we clean up with a Delphox. We can take a four prize turn. Not the cleanest game plan, but again, it's the one I've been leaning on heavily. Your key cards, your Charizards, your Prime Catchers, your Delphoxes, your Roxans. Lost Vacuum can also help us get to our 10 count a little bit faster than they do. And Delphox also helps us get up there. So Sableye could sprinkle in some math early. And then when they're sitting at two, they're taking 270 damage. We can just kind of punch them or we can Sableye first and then go, all right, Charizard, Charizard, good game. See you later. Next up, Snorlax Control. This one I'm also a little teched for, but it's not always perfect. Avoid benching liabilities. Get rid of your bad Pokemon. We play Lost Vacuum, we play Culverus, and we Comfy. So Manaphy, Delphox, and Spare Comfies. Get rid of those bad boys, make Erica's uh, invitation useless. Save your Lost Vacuums. Because they sit at 200 points with the Brave Charms or 250 with the Hero's Cape, we need to vacuum and get rid of those cards, not so they can Silene them. It does make it easier. It also makes thinning our hand a lot easier. Only use your Switch cards for knockouts. Do not try to push your Lost Zone count because this deck uses the Lost Zone but does not need to hit certain numbers right away. We, we will get there when we get there. Don't worry about it. Lost Mine in fours and sixes. They'll switch cards or they'll have some really awkward numbers. What we're trying to do is bring Snorlax below the 180 number so Burning Darkness can get through it. We're trying to bring Chi Yu down so we can get through it because it's at 190. Uh, Pidgeot, if they're playing it, again, we need to bring that one down from 280 to at least 180, right? Work fast, but not recklessly. Yes, you can move fast, but if you're not asking yourself why, then don't do it. Just know when to pull the plug. Things can go wrong. You can still lose. A strong Eerie or Misfortune Sister can cost you games. They're just sitting there going, go ahead. Go ahead, doing their thing. All right, next up, Pidgeot Control. This one, avoid benching liabilities, get rid of bad Pokemon, same kind of gist, save your lost vacuum, only use switch cards for knockouts. Expect them to punch back. This deck is extremely different because unlike Snorlax, this one is constantly changing, constantly evolving. They might be playing Wigglytuff, they might be playing Luxray with the reversal energy, they might be attacking with the Chiyu, they might be attacking with Radiant Charizard. Hell, they might be attacking with something I can't even think of right now, but the deck is constantly changing and you need to expect them to put pressure back on you with damage. So be prepared for that. Take out the Pidgeot pieces. That is what makes this whole deck run. It is the backbone, it is the core. If you can figure out ways to knock that off the board quickly, please do. Disclaimer, this one is ugly. Things can go wrong, you can still lose. Pidgeot will implore many unique tactics to get you. You have to be willing to adapt. This might be the worst part of the video that ages poorly because again, Pidgeot control has so much potential and so many big brains are working on it that I don't know what to really tell you other than you just have to be ready to be punched back. Next up, Arceus Giratina. My God, do I hate this deck. We are just gonna power through this one. Go first one possible. It's just a stupid deck. I really don't like this deck. Punt the draw engine. But barrels, make those judges hurt them just as much as it does you. Why should they get a barrel draw engine and, uh, you know, out of judge when we should both have to suffer avoid two hit KOing KOing Arceus this could be a Sharon's Kara Turo scenario again Arceus is just bait try not to hit it if you can hit the Bidoof's the Barrels, Giratina's the Iron Leaves anything else preferably unless you have to anticipate disruption again this deck is going to spam judge I'm like haha that's my win condition Delphox plus Roxanne you can use this to take out double Barrel. You can go Iron Leaves and a Barrel Again, if you can trade two for three with Delphox, please do. It's the fire type attacker you need for Iron Leaves. Maximum Belt is what they're running. Lost Impact is a hard, repeatable thing. But again, Giratina can kind of squeeze through your Charizards. We need to Lost Vacuum that card off as soon as we see it. So get rid of that one right away because they're only pulling that trick on us once. And then, of course, Iron Leaves. That is, again, the Delphox Roxanne turn. We're trying to get three prizes when they play the Leaves. So Delphox, well time it on the Barrel and then hit them with the Roxanne. You might just break them. Key cards, Roxanne, Prime Catcher. Again, we are priming up. It is a very specific combo. And as long as they don't judge us into Oblivion, we should be able to pull off. Again, I hate this deck. It is so stupid. The RNG of it is what wins games. Judge is not a valid, if judge is a valid strategy, but my God, is it a living on a prayer strategy? Anyway, anyway, I'm, 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 I'm good. Let's go, let's keep going. Lugia V-Star. So this one got some new legs with Chinchino and really brought in the Delphox. Go first one possible. They don't do anything going second. They just kind of uh, read the wind and pass. Eliminate Minchinos. They're gonna become Chinchinos, which are gonna be a problem for Charizard. We need to get them off the board as quickly as possible when we can. Ignore the V-Star. It's bait, 280 hit points is just too beefy and besides they're going to collapse stadium and off the board anyway look for closer pokemon what i mean is weird ears muse chinchinos iron hands radiant charizards whatever those pokemon are going to try to punch through our charizard late 
we need to try to clear them off the board preferably if we can. Luminions, yes, are tempting little fishies, but unless you have a second Charizard lined up and ready to go, don't always chase the support Pokemon. We got to deal with the threats ahead of us. Key card, Charizard, Prime Catcher. Again, makes life so much easier after a Colrus. Colrus, Prime Catcher, Cramorant, Knockout, one of those Minchinos. That's one less target we have to deal with. Or Colrus, Prime Catcher. Then we Delphox those two little things before they evolve and force them to attack us with a Lugia. And then at that point, they've probably played a Lumineon or something else. And we'll just chase that and then ignore the Lugia. Delphox is by far the best card in this matchup, hands down. Charizard gets you there, but again, Delphox is just such a good card. They put five energy on a Chinchino, we just blow it up. They try to put energy on both of them, we blow them both up, and that might be anywhere from five to ten energy off the board. Fantastic! Love it. Haven't worried anything on Lugia unless I absolutely... Next up, Charizard Pidgeot. This one is an ugly one, I'm sorry. I know, popular deck, why is it so bad? We just haven't teched for it. Go first when possible. Double up your Charmanders early. Cryotarize your Pidgey KOs. Pidgeot is what makes this deck run like butter, so if you can take the Pidgeys out early, it makes things a lot easier. If they don't develop Manaphy, use the Fox. They might not expect you, they might not see any water energy, hell, they might just forget about it, and then go for it. Take down the bird. That is a priority through and through. The bird's gotta go, because once the bird is gone, all of your rock sands are more effective, and it makes their strategy late more difficult to pull off. Key cards, we play a lot of gusting cards, prime catchers, counter catchers, bosses orders, you name it. If there's other cards that you can think of to make this matchup cleaner to deal with Pidgeot, I've seen people run reversal energy. I've seen people run Luxray with the uh, Neo energy over the Prime Catcher just to really take advantage of the bird. Uh, hell, you might even play your own bird. Take down their bird. That is how their deck falls apart. Be patient with your EX. We can't get into a swing and match because a lot of them will play Turos or they'll play Collapsed or get them off the board. We don't want to play that because it's like the Arceus where they're just going to be like, haha, you hit me and then I'm gone. Now what are you going to do? And you're like, oh shit, I can't do this. Key cards. Cramorant does 110, Delphox does 120. Delphox is situational because they're going to be playing Drachi for other things, or Manaphy for other things. But let's say they slip up. Let's say they're like, ah, I'm not worried about it in this matchup. Go for it. Most times they, a good player will put the Manaphy down. Charizard, again, you got to know when to pick and choose it because Burning Darkness, if you can get two swings with your Burning Darkness and then clean up later with a Sableye, that's even better too. Uh, it's This is a difficult one, I'm telling you. Like Maybe take the Rotom early. Uh, no. Don't even touch the Rotom. Rotom will be discarded with Collapse. Try to take out their Charmanders. Try to take out their Pidgeys. Uh, Sableye, sprinkle damage down if you can to, to bring them into your math. And then Charizard, clean up late. That's the only thing I can think of. If you can get multiple uses out of a Sableye, please do. But then you got to remember they're going to go for the Drachi. So best of luck. May the odds and the cards be in your favor. So here's a nice summary of all of the key matchups that I talked of, as well as a few I did not cover. Goldingo and Gardevoir and Great Tusk Mill. I didn't even bother bringing up. Those ones are just kind of all over the board. We play two vacuums, so Gardevoir is pretty good. Mill is just way too damn slow. Once you get Charizards and uh, your vacuums going, we're just running through them faster than they can run through us. Goldengo, again, Moonlight Shuriken canceling clone is just silly, and they can blow up your Charizards with Goldengo. So hitting two through 280 hit point Pokemon is never fun. This is a nice visual, a nice recap. Again, unfortunately, Charizard Pidgeot is your worst matchup on the board, but we do have quite a few good ones on the top there. Like, what's to say? I do really like this one and there's quite a few cards coming in the next set that could at least give this a nice little power spike where do i think this deck is going long term future proof it is 100 future proof because charizard is just statted to the nut it is a dual type fire uh, pokemon and dark so if you want to play the fire ex and get a little creative maybe you want to add in some other fire pokemon i didn't mention today by all means right now grass hasn't been relevant so i'm kind of forgetting about the weakness acceleration engine you can do some nutty things with three additional attachments plus attachment from hand every turn charizard plot armor it just got it i expect a charizard league battle deck coming down the line ogre pawn is coming in twilight masquerade i'm not scared of that deck but again we need to see it in action maybe it'll be scary but i'm not too worried about it right now and potential upgrades again we mentioned unfair stamp and for those of you who know about Ursa Luna, that one I really, really like in this deck. Like that is, I think, the missing piece that kind of bumps this one up. And it might become one of my favorite ways to play Lost Zone and Charizard in the future. So if you enjoyed the Lost Zone elements and if you enjoyed the Charizard elements, just want to say thank you for tuning in. I ramble a lot. Let me know down in the comments below what you'd like to see next, what you're playing in Temporal Forces, and have fun playing Pokemon, guys. Cheers.